Hi and welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about how you can accurately model the response of polycarbonate at different strain rates, slow rates, high rates, impact rates. And I'm also going to talk about what is causing the strain rate dependence in different material models. Specifically, how can different material models predict how the yield stress changes with applied strain rate? And to do this, I'm going to base my investigation on uh, results from Mulliken and Boyce, this specific paper that you can see here. So this paper talks about different uh, models uh, for polycarbonate, but they also have a really interesting experimental data that I used. So here on this page here, you can see some experimental data that I discretized and read into M calibration so I can analyze it and compare different material models. So you see there are four different strain rates. There's true stress, true strain for a polycarbonate nanocomposite. So let's open M calibration and we'll take a look. So after I converted that graph into uh, data for M calibration, this is what it looks like here. We have the four different strain rates and also added a load case for Poisson's ratio. It's usually, uh, usually useful to also specify how the bulk response depends on the material behavior. So that's what I did here. And then I calibrated a few different material models. And um, to save time, I was going to show you the results from these calibrations. We can talk about what they mean. So the first one I looked at is an ANSYS Bergstrom Boyce material model. The Bergstrom Boyce model, as you may know, was developed for rubber like materials. It's not really meant for stiff thermoplastics like polycarbonate, but it's a model you can use. And if you try to use it, the best you can come up with in this particular case is something like this. It shows the stress strain curves here in dashed lines. The solid lines are experimental ones. You see the average error is about 7%, which is not so bad, right? 7% error is not too bad in a finite element simulation in general. But we do see that the, the nature of the predictions is a little bit off. Uh, experimentally, the stress goes up and then it goes down after the max uh, stress, the yield stress. And um, that is not something you can do with the Bergstrom voice model. It wasn't developed for that. Um, so maybe we can do better. So let's try something else. So. I'm going to open another of my saved files here. We'll see what we can take a look at. Let's take a look at the, um, the PRF model. So Abacus has a, a set of material models called the Parallel Rheological Framework PRF models. And for thermoplastics, I often recommend and use the PRF, what I call the three nut per view power law uh, flow model. So that's something that's available in M calibration. We can calibrate this very quickly to this data. And um, if I do that, the predictions look like this. The error is about 7% again. Not so great. It's a little surprising, perhaps, that it's not better. And the reason why it doesn't do better is that the PRF models in Abacus, they can't really predict a drop in stress after yielding in any really productive way. So it, it, the best it comes up with is some kind of compromise in average here. So that's what's causing this predictive response. It doesn't match. The strain rate dependent modulus, it doesn't match the shape of the curves uh, and not particularly exciting um, in this case. But we can do better. So to model this kind of behavior, I've developed some models that are now part of the PolyU mod library. The first one I want to talk about is the three network model. I'm going to open my saved version of that. The three network model has three parallel networks, just like the, the, the Abacus model that we, we just looked at, the PRF model. And here are the predictions when I uh, have calibrated it. The error is down to 3%, so it's about half what the PRF model had. And uh, it's interesting, though, that it, it does overall feel better, right? It, it captures the strain rate dependence of the initial modulus. It captures the rate effects, as one would hope. And it also has this drop in stress after the maximum stress, the yield stress in this case. So it looks better. The average uh, error is smaller. It, it just makes me feel like this is a better representation of the material. The last model I will show you here is a, another model from the Polyuma library. This is the TNV model. The TNV model is often slightly better than the TNM, the three network model. The TNV model is a little bit more modern. It has some more features that can allow you to tailor the drop in stress after yielding, which is one of the weaknesses of the TN model. So if we use this model, see the error is slightly below 3% now. It's a kind of a sharp, sharp turn here, which is uh, the nature of how, how it calibrated it. But overall, it matches the data very well. 
in, in all aspects of the prediction. So this is a reasonable model to use for this type of material, both at small strain rates and high strain rates. So to compare these models, I'm going to switch over to a spreadsheet that I prepared. You can see here uh, on the x-axis the different material models. On the y-axis we have average error in percent. I just plotted it. And we can see that the PolyU mod TNV and the TN models have a error that's about half of the ANSYS BB model or the job Abacus Johnson Cook or Johnson Cook models in general and the Abacus PRF models. So this, this is the accuracy you can expect when you're dealing with simulations of polycarbonate. And um, these are the choices you have uh, mainly to work with for this type of material. What I want to talk about here also is the, the, another thing that was pointed out by uh, Mulligan and Boyce in their paper, and that is when you plot yield stress as a function of logarithmic strain rate, for many materials, it's almost a linear uh, response. So that is, you, if you have that, then you can extrapolate to high strain rates from low strain rate data. Very convenient. But for polycarbonate, that's typically not the case. There is a bifurcation or change in, in uh, yield stress with strain rate that is not linear, as you can see here. And uh, I'll scroll up uh, to the top of this paper. There's another one for uh, another polycarbonate material. You see that it's a, it's a different strain rate dependence at high strain rates compared to, to low strain rates. So the question here is like, what aspects of the material models that we deal with can handle this? And what's con controlling this? In, in their work, Mulligan and Boyce, they, they, they came up with their own material model but I was, what I'm showing here is that you can actually uh, get the same kind of response using uh, the polyumod material models. So let me start by showing this one here. So I started doing a little study of this. I picked a single element, single network representation, the smallest type of model you can come up with, a linear uh, hyperelastic spring and the power law uh, flow element. And then I explored how these parameters in this network control the yield stress that you would predict as a function of strain rate. So the baseline here is I used a mu value of 100, kappa 500, tau hat 10, and m value of 5. And then I tried different m values. So m values uh, here uh, of uh, 4 is the blue line. It shows that the yield stress is very strongly dependent on strain rate, even when the strain rate is, is on the log scale. And you can see this kind of response. For very high M values, M of up to 18, 19, 20, which is typically the highest that I would recommend anyone using, it's almost a linear dependence on strain rate, as you can see. So you can get this either linear or nonlinear, depending on how you pick the M value, and that controls the yield stress as a function of strain rate. For this model, right? In real life, we have multiple parallel networks, and I'll come back to what that does. Another way to look at this is to consider um, the influence of tau hat. So same little rheological model with spring in a dashboard like this, and I vary the value of tau hat, and I keep all the other parameters constant. And what happens when you do that, you see that tau hat is now the variable that controls the slope of these curves, yield stress versus strain rate. The slope of that is controlled to a large extent by the tau hat value. And these are all done with a pretty high M value. That's why they're more or less linear in this regime here. And that's what you typically use for thermoplastics anyway. You use a high M value because that gives you better uh, predictions. The next parameter I looked at uh, to investigate was it's the M value, the, the mu value, the stiffness of the spring. And as one can uh, easily understand when you think about it, the stiffness of the spring here really has nothing to do with the yield stress. And therefore, it actually doesn't influence the yield stress. It's independent of that, which is kind of interesting. The last one I will talk about is how you can think about these things once you put multiple networks together. So here is a two network, very simple model, Nihokian in parallel with Nihokian and this uh, parallel flow element again. And then what I try to do here is to show you if you change the, the stiffness of the first spring, not the second one, the second one we know didn't make a difference, but the first one in parallel, as one expect, that will scale the whole curve up and down because these two are in parallel. So you can, visually start to see how you can combine these networks to get the yield stress as a function of strain rate that you like. And if you have multiple, three of them, for example, in parallel, and equilibrium perhaps, and two viscoplastic uh, flow elements, 
you can get a bilinear response, as was pointed out by Mulligan and Boyce, simply by picking the parameters that you like for each of these networks. So that's absolutely doable to do. You can also have M calibration do it for you by providing enough experimental data, similar to what I went through in my exercise earlier when we tried to fit their data to a few different uh, viscoplastic material models. So, so in summary, polycarbonate is a tricky material because it's highly strain rate dependent. The strain rate dependents have multiple domains depending on the strain rate, but there are good material models out there for it. Many of the basic material models don't work very well, but there are some good ones. Uh, the ones I recommend are typically the, the polyumod TN model and the polyumod TNV models. Those are my favorites for polycarbon. They work very well. And uh, if you're interested, you should give them a try. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them below. Thank you.